Welcome back to Worldview. And uh, well, on the penultimate day of just concluded UN Climate Change Conference in Marrakesh, Moroccan Foreign Minister Salden El Mazura announced that the proclamation had been agreed by all participants. Almost 200 governments committed to strengthening and support to efforts to eradicate poverty, ensure food security, and to take stringent action to deal with climate change challenges in agriculture. While temperatures are set to hit the highest since record began in the 19th century this year, beating 2015, triggering a melting of ice sheets, damaging coral reefs, and spurring heat waves. In the COP22 document, Rich Nation reaffirmed a goal to mobilizing 100, US, 100 billion U.S. dollars to finance from both public and private sources by 2020 to help developing countries. The Paris Agreement seeks to limit a rise in global average temperatures to well below 2.0 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial times, ideally 1.5 degrees by uh, slashing greenhouse gas emissions. Stringent action to deal with climate change challenges in agriculture. We call for urgently raising ambition and strengthening cooperation amongst ourselves to close the gap between current emissions, trajectories, and the pathway needed to meet the long-term temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. We call for an increase and in the volume, flow, and access to finance for climate projects alongside improved capacity and technology, including from developed to developing countries. And now joining me in studio to have a conversation regarding that is Benson Ocheng, who is an environmental lawyer. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Morning, Mike. All Pleasure right. To be here. Yeah, excellent and welcome. Now, maybe just to start off and to reflect, uh, the Paris Agreement kicked in on the 4th of uh, this month. And basically, that this was a follow-up uh, in Marrakesh. Uh, maybe just to refresh ourselves, what was in the agreement in, uh, uh, in Paris Agreement? Uh, Paris Agreement is very important. We have to reflect back to 1992, uh, the Rio Earth Summit, where the United Nations Framework Convention mm. on Climate Change was signed. It's called UN Triple, UNFCCC. And uh, basically, this is an agreement which the whole world agreed is the way to go in terms of dealing with the problem of climate change. The first protocol to that convention was called the Kyoto Protocol, right. which was in force up to this year on, on 4th. Actually, it expires in 2020. Mm -hmm. But there needed to be a successor to the Kyoto Protocol mm -hmm. because a protocol to a framework convention is actually the document which now gives actual commitments in terms of targets, time-bound targets which are to be achieved by the parties to the convention. Mm -hmm. That is why Paris Agreement was very important, because you remember in 2009, countries went to Copenhagen, that is in Denmark, and failed to agree to a successor of the Kyoto Protocol. And Kyoto Protocol was initially supposed to expire in 2012, which means that if we didn't have a successor to the Kyoto Protocol, there would be no commitment or committing agreement to what countries would do to deal with the problem of climate change. And just as you indicated, it would mean that we would go without any mitigating uh, framework right. for increment beyond the two degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. which scientists tell us if the temperature, if the global temperature were to increase by more than two degrees Celsius beyond what it was in the pre-industrial period, then it will be irreversible, which means that the whole so, world so in short, disappear. Right uh, now, we are at a very critical point, given that uh, it has to come down. If it does not come down now, then, it, like you say, it's irreversible. It has to stop. Mm -hmm. It has to slow down, or it has to come down. There are only those three possibilities. As of now, if we continue at the current rate, we would go beyond the two degrees Celsius by 2050, mm -hmm. which means that beyond 2050, the impacts would be irreversible. Right. If it stops at the current level, it will mean we will not have gone beyond the two degrees Celsius. But what is being sought is that after 2050, the Paris Agreement and any other agreement that would be done after that would help us to limit it beyond a maximum of 1.5 increment 
compared to the pre-industrial era level. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are in for very bad times. All right, now just maybe to highlight and to get a clear picture, what's the impact likely to be caused by the two degree increase by 2050 if we continue at the rate at which we're going? Well, that is normally called the tipping point. Mm -hmm. It would be the worst scenario because then it would mean that uh, there would be nothing, that there is nothing that could be done to reverse the trends. It means that the negative impacts of climate change, the unmitigated floods, the high temperatures, the heat waves, the melting of ice in a lot of high mountains, Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, continued ocean and sea level rise, like coastal lowlands or countries that are below sea level will all be submerged. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of animals also would have to disappear from the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Those are just some of the impacts. As a country, we would have it very tough with continued drought or more frequent drought, high, very high rainfall, very heavy flooding, and those kind of uh, unmitigated effects of climate change. Okay, now we have 200 countries that basically have signed towards the Paris Agreement and uh, the Marrakesh uh, meeting brought that to the fore. Does that get us any closer to making sure that all these governments that have signed in will now be bound legally to ensure that they do what needs to be done? Yes, Paris Agreement was very important because its predecessor, the Kyoto Protocol, which it is taking over from, had specific commitments for developed countries to achieve in terms of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. The important thing about Paris Agreement is that it's not just for the developed countries alone. All countries who have signed the agreement have made some commitment to do something about the effects of climate change and their greenhouse gas emissions, which are the ones responsible for causing global warming. Like in the case of Kenya, like every other country, we submitted what is called nationally determined actions uh, or contributions. So that what we are committing with that is that we are going to undertake certain measures in various sectors where we emit a lot of greenhouse gases to ensure that by 2050, in our case, we reduce our emissions by 30%. Mm -hmm. That is what other countries have done under the Paris Agreement. So unlike Kyoto where there were specific targets and commitments mm -hmm. to reduce greenhouse gases, what the Paris Agreement has done is to commit these countries to voluntarily submit what they will do in terms of reducing greenhouse gases through their nationally determined contributions. Okay. So we are part of that global commitment as mm -hmm. a country. But maybe now to bring it locally, what are some of the commitments that we have made as Kenya uh, to ensure that we reduce those emissions by 30%? Specifically as a country, we would look at our Vision 2030 mm -hmm. and Vision 2030 projects or uh, uh, we call them flagship projects, as the main areas where we want to reduce greenhouse gases. Because, well, let's start from this premise. Kenya's production of greenhouse gases is negligible, at least in global terms. But the unique thing about the Paris Agreement is that people are saying this is a common problem. And so whatever small you do, you need to do your part to reduce the it problem. contributes to the greater vision of having e the whole e uh, emissions reduced. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that as a country, mm -hmm. we sat down and looked at the sectors where we produce the most greenhouse gases, and we said, yes, it is transport, it is agriculture, it is uh, uh, renewable energy, and, of course, forestry. Remember, under the Constitution, we have committed to achieve 10% forest cover by a certain period. So if we achieve that, it means we are also contributing to reduction of greenhouse gases mm -hmm. because forests act as carbon sinks. Uh, we are also saying that we are going to increase exponentially uh, our use of renewable energy. And hence you hear about wind power projects and you hear about other means of renewable energy. You see some tax reduction in gadgets that are uh, basically uh, environmental have, friendly. Uh, yes, environmentally friendly mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of actions we are taking. In agriculture, we are talking of climate smart agriculture, where we reduce tillage and we depend on certain forms of uh, use of resources mm -hmm. in, and tillage of land which do not expose the land too much. Mm -hmm. We commit to reducing uh, deforestation and those kind of stuff. So under our commitments, we are looking at these four key sectors as the areas where we can make the most to contribute our bit to reducing greenhouse gases. Okay. Now, it goes without saying that this definitely has got a financial uh, implication and would require a budget. Do we have a budget and who is funding it? 
Well, we, in the global framework and uh, uh, the climate change framework, there is what we call the climate, Green Climate Fund. And you just mentioned it. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember in 2009 at the Copenhagen, developed countries, when they saw that the negotiations were collapsing, uh, Hillary Clinton came up with the idea, uh, which was supported by the rest of the countries, that by 2020, developed countries would mobilize at least $100 billion a year worth of climate finance that would go to help developing countries to meet certain actions to uh, adapt and to reduce climate change. So that is a target that countries are still working towards so that by the year 2020, there would be this 100 billion. Remember, even in Marrakesh, that was actually the key issue. How do you implement the commitments under the Paris Agreement and what kind of resources do you avail so that countries can meet those commitments? So finance is usually a key issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, within the global framework, of course, we have that Green Climate Fund. Remember, we also indicated that the Kyoto Protocol is still in existence up to the year 2020. Under that, there is the Climate Adaptation Fund, mm -hmm. which is also meant to help countries to adapt to climate change. And uh, the issue of how to reach the 100 billion and what role the private sector, civil society, and governments are going to play is still a matter of negotiation. And in Marrakesh, one of the key areas that was agreed is that this will be concluded by the year 2018. That is when we will have a clear action plan on how we are going to raise the finances to help us to move uh, with the commitments from the year 2020. Okay. Now, the U.S. has been at the forefront of uh, this conversation of climate change, pushing uh, and literally ensuring that countries buy into the idea because it is a serious conversation to have. However, we have President-elect Donald Trump who has declared publicly, it's on record, him saying he does not believe in climate change. How is that likely to impact this whole process? Yeah, it was actually a very worrying point even for the delegates in Marrakesh because just two, the conference started just two days before the U.S. election. Mm. When people started, it was thought as a given that Hillary Clinton would He's win. To, yes. And knowing that she would continue Obama policies, mm. people were not worried. Mm. By the second day, Donald Trump was actually the winner of the election, and it almost derailed the negotiations. But then, as is oft the case with these multilateral uh, issues, delegates decided not to worry too much about what the U.S. is going to do. In any event, people are saying, well, the Paris Agreement is more than just one country mm. or just more than one individual. But let's face it, the U.S. is a very important a player, player in the global climate change negotiation. In any event, it contributes almost 20% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Even if, if it were to draw, withdraw from the Paris Agreement, you realize that there would be a very technical problem because for the agreement to come to force on the fourth in the first place, 55 can, at least 55 member countries needed to sign it. And of those 55, they ought to have been once responsible for contributing at least 55% of the greenhouse gas emissions globally which means that if you removed 20% from 55, you would remain with 35%. Mm -hmm. There is every likelihood that if United States were to withdraw, we would not reach that target, 55, which means that whatever actions we take after that would still not keep us below the 2%. That is how important it is. But of course, uh, delegates are ad adopting a wait and see attitude mm -hmm. and uh, putting on a brave face that uh, such drastic action would not be taken. Would in any taken. event, as is the case with multilateral agreements, is not something that will happen overnight. Even yes. if the US and uh, Trump were to withdraw, it mm. would take years, probably up to four years, mm. to formally withdraw from the treaty. The other, of course, downside to it is that the US could simply refuse to implement because using executive orders or his high position, mm. it is very possible that they could just drag their feet on the commitments that have been made, which would be unfortunate. All right. Because of time, We'll have to take a cut it there, but thank you very much, Benson Ocheng, who's an environmental lawyer, uh, for filling us in on what was happening in Marrakesh and, of course, the uh, climate change conversation, which has been a major uh, debate that's been going on. This is Worldview. We'll take a short break. When we come back, let's look at the international dailies.